I'm Steve Davis. I'm our literary curator here. And we're so excited to have this celebration of J. Frank Doby. Uh, many of you know that it was a gift of Doby papers from Bill and Sally Whitliff to this university in 1986 that established the Whitliff Collections. Bill and Sally have inspired so many of us over the years. And it's thanks to them that I first began working on this book and their support and encouragement throughout guided me. And so it's only fitting that the essential J. Frank Doby is dedicated to Bill Whitliff and to Sally Whitliff. Sally, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this new collection of Doby's best writing is published with our partners and friends at Texas A&M University Press. I think a couple of them are here today, Shannon Davies and Marianne Jacob. Hey, you found seats, great. Okay. Um, and as you know, we have an all-star lineup here today to help celebrate Doby. And uh, you'll see that each of our speakers shares a special connection to Frank Doby. And in a bit, we're going to show you a short video of Bill Whitliff talking about his relationship with Doby and a little bit of bonus footage um, on Doby him, from Doby himself, um, which there's not a lot of video out there on Doby, but uh, there, there was some done just a couple of years before he died that you'll, you'll see a few seconds of. Um, and what I'd really like to do to sort of begin our program is to tell you a bit about J. Frank Doby, who wrote the stories in this book. Uh, most of which are nonfiction, and most of which tell us a good deal about what it means to live in Texas. Doby was born in the late 1800s at the tail end of the great cattle drives uh, in the brush country of South Texas. In the 1920s, after he served in World War I, he became an English instructor at the University of Texas. And there he was teaching British literature. Um, at that time, there was no such thing as American literature because as far as the academy was concerned, <laughs> American writing had not proven itself yet. So, um, and as for Texas, you know, you could say that reading and writing came kind of late to Texas. So, um, <laughs> Doby, you know, he, he understood that while that was the case, our state did have a very proud oral storytelling tradition among African Americans, Mexican Americans, Anglo Americans, and he had grown up hearing real life accounts of these epic quests from the frontier days of, for lost mines and buried treasures. He would learned of renegade longhorns that had busted out of northern stockyards and traveled 800 miles to return to their beloved Carencia. He knew vaqueros who'd encountered ghosts every bit as real as that of Hamlet's father. And he'd heard accounts of trickster coyotes that rivaled anything the Brothers Grimm had ever dreamed of. And so Doby was worried, you know, here he is teaching British literature to kids from Texas. And he was thinking, you know, um, much of our own cultural heritage, which had never been written down, is in danger of disappearing. So he made it his mission to go out and collect stories from the surviving old timers. He turned those stories into best-selling books and in the process invented what we consider Texas literature. And Doby went on to inspire many other writers. He, uh, dominated the state's literary scene for the rest of his life. But he was also more than a writer, um, believing that Texas needs brains, more true now than ever. <laughs> Doby, no, it is true, right? What do brains do? Yeah. Doby constantly fought for human rights and intellectual freedom. In the 1920s, he single-handedly integrated the Texas Folklore Society one of the writers he mentored, Jovita Gonzalez, became president of that society in 1930. And if you know anything about the history of Texas, to know that a Mexican-American woman was leading this major intellectual organization in the state tells you a lot about what was happening around Doby and the people at that time. Um, in 1934, Doby invited J. Mason Brewer into the Folklore Society as its first African-American member. And during the 1940s, Doby was the most prominent white Texan to champion civil rights. He publicly called for integrating the University of Texas in the 1940s. And guess how the university liked that? <laughs> yeah, they fired him. And, um, and then he was investigated by J. Edgar Hoover's FBI as a possible communist. Um, and beyond you know, his, just his courage on, and his leadership on civil rights, Doby was also a visionary environmentalist. He helped inspire Big Bend National Park 
He campaigned against the widespread use of chemical poisons such as DDT. Dobie understood the balance of nature and as part of that, the role of predators in an ecosystem in ways that our society is only now beginning to catch on to. And if you're familiar with what happened in recent years when wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park and how the, the land immediately rebounded because those deer weren't just getting all fat and happy eating all the grass they wanted along the riverbanks. Now they have to sort of make a run for it every now and then. Um, that's the kind of stuff Dobie was talking about in the 1940s, you know. And um, Dobie was actually ahead of his time in a lot of ways. Uh, back when he was going out and collecting those stories from the old timers, all of the proper historians were busy chronicling the military exploits of generals and presidents, the great man theory of history. And Dobie was really not interested in gunfights and military battles. He was interested in the, exploring the ways people live among each other. And no one had, cop had really coined the term social history at this point, but that's exactly what Dobie was doing. So what he was chronicling was our social history. And in doing so, by rescuing our stories, he left us this priceless cultural inheritance. A lot of that you'll see in this book. Um, and over the years, you know, a lot of authors uh, have been inspired by what Dobie was doing. Larry McMurtry, I'll mention, uh, borrowed quite heavily from Dobie in uh, writing Lonesome Dove. And as I point out in my introduction to this book, Cormac McCarthy uh, adapted Dobie's own writing nearly word for word <laughs> in crafting one of his own novels. I'm just gonna say it again. This man, <laughs> considered one of the greatest writers in the world, thought enough of J. Frank Dobie's writing to pay him the ultimate compliment, stealing from him. <laughs> so, and that's actually in the archive here. And when I saw that, that's when I realized, you know, with just a little judicious editing, basically pruning back some of the brushy overgrowth, because Dobie did like to di digress, but if you prune back just a little bit of that, Dobie's eloquent and erudite voice comes bounding back to life. He's no longer a dusty old relic from a bygone era. He's a writer for our times as much as his own times. And this book is full of great stories that only Dobie could tell, many of them enlivened by his personal adventures. This is a guy who, as many of you know, was in England during World War II, dodging <laughs> Nazi bombs. And then after the war, post-war Germany, he traveled throughout that country for the army. And so he witnessed uh, the Nuremberg trials. He was at Dachau. He went behind Soviet lines to tour Hitler's chancellery before it was destroyed. And so Dobie was really a citizen of the world in a lot of ways, but at the same time, you know, he was completely at home, riding by a mule for months across the mountains of Mexico in search of the greatest lost mine in North American history and finding it. But as far as Dobie was concerned, you know, the real treasure were the people he met along the way and the stories they shared. That's what he was looking for. And so the best of Dobie's stories are collected in this book, and reading them connects you to some of the best elements of Texas. And I want to tell you something about Dobie. Um, he still has legs, you know. Within a month of this book's publication, it has sold out. Our friends at Texas A&M University. Wow. I know. It's amazing. And um, I'm going to, I'll just say, I get a lot of credit for this, but it's Dobie because I've, I've had books before and none of them have ever sold out in the first month. <laughs> this guy. Um, our friends at AM are rushing a second edition into print. Um, a couple of online places still have some copies, but the title is on back order at most bookstores. Um, but get this at the Whitliff Collections because we are forward thinking. We staged our own raid on the AM Press Warehouse before the book sold out. <laughs> So guess who has copies for sale here today of this first edition? <laughs> so if you're thinking about buying this book or thinking about buying two or three copies as gifts <laughs> for family members, deserving friends, you should definitely go ahead and do it today. Um, and let's see, before we begin with our guest speakers, I do want to recognize just a few of the people here. Um, our, University President Denise Trouth and her husband John Huffman are both here. Thank you both. And we have our Vice President for Information Technology, Ken Pierce, with his wife, Jill. And our Associate Vice President in charge of the University Library, Joan Heath, is here, I believe. Joan? And I want to do a 
special shout out for our Whitliff Collections director, Dr. David Coleman, um, because David's not the kind of person who will ever toot his own horn. It's one of the lovable things about David, honestly. But I do want to say a couple of words about David and his leadership. Um, David is, in Dobie's own words, a paisano, a fellow countryman. David is an extremely intelligent and perceptive and hardworking and good-hearted person. He came here nearly a decade ago as a photography expert, but he also has one of the most astute literary minds of anyone I've encountered. Perhaps best of all, David is an excellent, brilliant strategic thinker, and he is the perfect person to lead the Whitliff Collections at this time, as he has been for much of the past decade. And I will tell you that Bill Whitliff had absolute trust and confidence in David, as does everyone on David's staff. Our successes here are due to many people, the Whitliff family, university administration, our wonderful staff, many friends and supporters we have, and we all work together as a team to make great things happen here. But I want to just point out very quickly that it's through David's leadership that we have acquired some of the most amazing archives in recent years that are the envy of any collection in the country. Um, David's the one who led the charge for us to acquire the papers of Sandra Cisneros and Naomi Shehab Nye, uh, Mary Carr, who wrote The Liars Club, John Retchie, the author of City of Night, and the extraordinary Ramon Hernandez Tejano Music Collection. So you can see we're in such great shape with David leading this collection. David is also guiding the um, newest phase of the Woodless expansion. And you may have noticed a bit of construction around here. This is, David is working to, with the construction people to bring us these beautiful new spaces that will open next spring um, and we'll be able to showcase more of our treasures, including a brand new gallery devoted to Texas music. And so I just want to say, David, I know this is embarrassing to you, but I want to thank you for all that you've done and all you are doing. Thank you. And let's see, and I uh, heard some rumors there might be a few members of the Dobie family here today. Is that true? If you're a Dobie family member, could you stand up so we can recognize you and welcome you? Please. Come on, Dobie. You can do it. All right. Welcome. And did Patty Clark make it in today? Is Patty here? Oh, there you are. Hey. Patty Clark uh, is taking a break from her job directing the Austin Zoo to come join us today. And she's the one who donated hundreds of these uh, amazing vintage magazines and journals that have Dobie stories in them, many of which never made it into any printed bibliography because Patty's a genius at using the internet to find things. And um, all of this stuff really nourished me as I was doing this book. You'll see several of these beautiful publications in the current display. So it's so good to see you and thank you. And I also want to mention that Louise O'Connor is here today. And Louise is such a good friend of the Whitlove Collections. And she gave us um, recently this very special edition of The Longhorns which was owned by her grandmother, Kate Stoner O'Connor. And Kate O'Connor and J. Frank Doby were good friends for a long time. And Doby stayed at the O'Connor Ranch while he was riding the Longhorns and wrote this lovely inscription to Kate after um, the book was published, which you'll see. And then um, this is an example of Doby's kind of complex uh, relationship with a lot of people. Um, after Doby died, Kate O'Connor opened up that copy of the Longhorns and she wrote uh, something inside. She said basically that J. Frank Doby died today unloved and unmourned because he had defected to the enemy, communism. <laughs> so we have that on exhibit. Be sure to look for that. And thank you, Louise. That's just an amazing artifact to have. So, you know, I could go on and on with this kind of stuff. Um, there are so many of you to thank. Uh, a lot of you are in the acknowledgments. A lot of you, we just really appreciate everything you do for the Whitlifts. So if you're a donor, an advisory council member, a staff member, a supporter, or a friend who just helps make books and events like this happen. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And so it's time for our first presenter. Chip Dameron is a professor emeritus at UT Rio Grande Valley, the author of 10 books of poetry. In 2016, Chip was awarded a Dobie Paisano Fellowship and he took up residence at Dobie's old ranch outside of Austin. And I'll tell you why he wanted to bring Chip here today. He has written a wonderful new book about his stay at Paisano titled Mornings with Dobie's Ghost. Some of you may have seen already that Chip has this book for sale here today and he is signing copies. Mornings with Dobie's Ghost is a unique and completely charming book of poems 
that gets J. Frank Doby exactly right. And Chip has gener generously agreed to come up and share a bit of that book with us. So welcome, Chip Dameron. Okay. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. Clear enough? Um, and thank you so much, Steve. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that I have read uh, the new Doby book from cover to cover, and it is just wonderful. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great treasure. Um, and as Steve mentioned, I did have the opportunity to spend four months uh, at the, at the ranch, what a wonderful experience. I was there with my wife. <clears throat> and um, shortly after getting there and feeling the, sort of the spirit of the place, um, it occurred to me that uh, getting up, if I got up in the mornings and went out early and a cup of coffee that, uh, um, you know, Dobie's spirit, Dobie's ghost, you know, might visit uh, a visiting writer like me, step, step in and, and, and have something to say about his past, or maybe things that had happened in the 50 years since he passed away uh, in uh, 1964. And so um, I've sort of channeled his, uh, his uh, spirit, I guess, and so these poems are in his voice. Uh, the, I'll read just a few, uh, give you a flavor, and the first is called Ranch and Creek. You've been here two weeks now and ought to feel why I bought it. It takes 10 minutes from the gate at the main road to get to the house. That's close enough. Too bad the town just keeps coming this way. Like those mountains, ma mansions on the ridge just past where the sun comes up. You can see a bunch from the rise on the road, but at the house, they're mostly hidden and too far to hear from. Still, an abomination. I surely like the original house, but I know it was breaking down like an old horse that's seen too many winners. At least it wasn't torn down like so much else from my day, but modernized as you folks require now. I'm getting used to the limestone siding on the new part, good Texas rock. You can still hear the creek, can't you, day and night. I wouldn't have a ranch without one, just a plain piece of land otherwise, one place as good as another. And I had Waller Creek singing to me at our place in town. I'll promise you one thing. If this creek ever dries up for good, I'll disappear too. Thank you. And I, uh, for the next two poems, I'd like to give a shout out to William Jensen. I don't know if, if he's with us today, but uh, he's... Uh, uh, the editor of uh, Southwestern American Literature, and he and his staff published five of these poems in a, a recent uh, issue of the, uh, of the journal. This one is called Totem, uh, and as many of you know, the Roadrunner, or Paisano, uh, 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 for which Adobe uh, chose the name of his, his ranch, uh, was a favorite uh, animal of his, uh, and a, a kind of a totem figure. And the poem goes like this. We were cut from the same cloth, the Paisano and I, both bound to this land, <clears throat> both with two toes aimed forward and two stuck firmly in the past. Bertha claimed my white hair stood up like a roadrunner's crest when I got wound up and feisty. Some wag back in the 40s taped a sketch to my office door, a bold Paisano with a boot against a rattlesnake's neck pecking out the brains of a head labeled UT Regent. <laughs> well, I might have wished then I could be that ruthless, but it sure did give me a belly laugh. I've long admired that brazen bird, smart, tough, and faster on two legs than any cowman can go except on horseback. Good to have a totem that can leave this earth on short flights of fancy, but prefers the feel of common dirt between its toes. And uh, second poem that I'll read from the, uh, that was published uh, in the uh, journal here from Texas State. Uh, this one, uh, uh, Steve mentioned McMurtry. 
Uh, McMurtry in the 60s, you know, Do uh, Dobie died in 64. McMurtry was a rising novelist who uh, uh, w was doing some excellent work and also had some strong opinions about those who had preceded him. Um, and uh, he had some fairly harsh things to say about Dobie and his work. And so this, this is what uh, Dobie's ghost told me about all of this. <laughs> it's called The Novelist and the Storyteller. I'll give McMurtry credit for what he's done with all those stories. He's a real novelist, knows how to get inside his men and women, create a world that pulls a reader in and on like a long winter dream. Hell, I knew he was a writer when he reviewed Henry Miller in college. His pot shots at me were pretty easy to get off after I was gone, and some of his bullets were on the mark. I found my anecdotage could get tedious too, but I wasn't a novelist. I was a storyteller, taking tales from far and near, open campfire or some old cowboy's living room, and shaping them on the page giving them as much of the grit and texture of the brush country or West Texas desert as I could, yarns and folk tales and ghost stories, gifts received and passed on. And maybe old Larry, older now than I ever was, owes me a bit of small thanks for pointing toward the Longhorns and Mustangs and turning him loose. <laughs> And the last poem, uh, as, as some of you well know, and as Steve uh, uh, documented in, in this new uh, collection too, uh, Dobie had terrible uh, trouble in the winters with cedar fever in the Austin area. And uh, so this poem uh, uh, gives, uh, gives him a chance to reflect on that. Cedar fever. <clears throat> It may be December and cold now, and lots of the ranch is going dormant. But come over here and take a look at this cedar. See those rusty tips dressing up the shaggy limbs? Well, tell you what, here tomorrow or next week, one day real soon, thanks to the wet spring and wet months this fall, you'll be blessed with a fine mist of cedar pollen. And right across the creek valley, between the gate and that bluff, you'll see a haze not from a fire or pollution, but mountain cedar. Betacheck used to get my goat this time of year saying, that's incorrect, Dobie, you mean ash juniper, not mountain cedar. <laughs> and I'd say, hell, Betty, give it any name you want, it's still plain evil. <laughs> I had to leave town, turn my classes over to Bertha, it crippled me so. Best place was West Texas, out in the desert air where I could grade papers write a little on another book. One thing good about being dead, these damn trees can't torture me anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Chip. I just want to ask you a, a couple of quick questions. Sure. Um, you mentioned to me in an email exchange that your sort of personal relationship to Dobie uh, went back far beyond uh, your Paisano Fellowship. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, when I was growing up, my, my dad had a collection of books, and uh, I remember seeing them up on the bookcase, and uh, one of them was a, Texas, uh, a Texan in England. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, I, I never read it back then. Uh, but uh, uh, th uh, that, um, uh, when I was working on this project, uh, my brother, who's here uh, today and who's the historian in the family, I uh, had kept that copy and, uh, uh, and had pointed out to me that it was inscribed, uh, had a special inscription. It was my mother inscribing it to my father, who was a naval officer in World War II and was uh, on his way uh, back from the war in 1945. And so it was her Christmas present to him two years before I came along. Uh, so that was special. It also happened that uh, when I was a early, early in my graduate student years uh, at UT, in Austin, I was a, to make ends meet, I was a dorm counselor uh, at uh, uh, the uh, Dobie uh, Center uh, Tower there, 27 uh, story residence hall. And, uh, you know, and of course I knew who it was named for. What I didn't realize then um, was that uh, Dobie had uh, a, a great distaste for the UT Tower, 
which was built in the 30s, and he just thought it was an abomination. Uh, thought it ought to be taken and laid, laid down flat. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and would have, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he, uh, you know, had turned over a few times uh, in his grave when they named this tower for him. Uh, and then one last thing, uh, four, maybe four or five years after that, uh, I was living with uh, several friends uh, on the corner of, of a house that was on the, house, uh, on the corner of uh, Hampton uh, Road and 26th Street. And uh, uh, the, unbeknownst to me, I was, I was just about a stone's throw away from the, the Dobie house. Uh, at that time, uh, Edgar Kincaid, uh, Bertha's nephew, was living there. She, was, she, had, she had passed away, and, and he would have been living there then. And I had no idea, but uh, um, uh, I, I must have ridden past that place hundreds of times over a year and a half. And then I was delighted to, to find out uh, during my, my time at the ranch uh, about the house and uh, the wonderful job that uh, Dudley Doby Jr. did to save it and to renovate it and then to see that it got uh, returned or turned to, the, uh, to UT and it became the Michener School um, of uh, Creative Writing location. So um, anyway, those are, those are kind of special connections that, uh, that have occurred for me over the years. Okay. Thanks, Chip. Thanks. Thanks very much. Coincidentally, this was not choreographed, but our next speaker is Dudley Doby Jr., <laughs> who was born here in San Marcos. His father, Dudley Sr., was Frank Doby's first cousin, and the two men were very close. Both were educators and writers. Dudley Jr. graduated from law school at UT Austin in 1964. Same year, Doby died. Same year, Sally and Bill were getting the Encino Press underway with a volume of J. Frank Dobie's. And um, Dudley has enjoyed a very distinguished career as an attorney, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Dudley uh, being such a notable friend and benefactor of Texas culture. He's been on the executive council of the Texas State Historical Association. He's a donor to the Whitliff Collections. And as Chip alluded to, Dudley and his wife, Seiza, who's also here, have done so much to preserve, and you can really say save, a big chunk of J. Frank Doby's legacy, which we will talk about in just a moment. But first, we have Dudley here to present a very special Doby story for us. Dudley Doby. Thank you, Steve. And uh, President Trouth, uh, Director Coleman, Mrs. Whitliff, and um, Steve, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here today. I want to make a full disclosure up front that I was born with this name and, and did not earn it. Uh, Chip remarked about Paisano, and Steve, if I can take a couple of extra minutes to uh, add a little footnote to Paisano. Chip and I have both known uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Adams at UT Austin, the, the longtime director of the Paisano Fellowship Program. And he is a warrior. He would call me occasionally and, and just uh, moan about how developers were salivating over the Paisano Ranch because it's a, a pristine 200-acre property on the upper reaches of Barton Creek, just west of Austin. And um, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge a person here, a longtime friend of Sazes and mine, Charlene Johnston, who's right here in the third row. <clears throat> Charlene is the daughter-in-law of Ralph Johnston, a prominent Houston citizen, and a, he was a, a student of J. Frank's. And after J. Frank died, the Ralph Johnston and the Johnston family funded the initial purchase of the Paisano Ranch to preserve it for fellowship purposes. And Charlene 
Your family has been wonderful. <clears throat> privilege it is to uh, participate in this event for a new book by Steve Davis, celebrating not only his gifted writing, but the gifts of another writer. In, in speaking of writers, at the inaugural Voices of Texas Gala in Austin in 1993, then Governor Ann Richards quipped with her classic wry smile, that what a writer likes to write most is his signature on the back of a check. <laughs> so, and I'm sure that that's the case with many writers, but it's not true of Steve Davis. As noted on the back of the dust jacket of this book, uh, Steve has donated all of the royalties of the book to the J. Frank Doby Library Trust, and thus his generosity will directly benefit libraries in small towns in Texas for years to come. <laughs> Congratulations, Steve. This is a, a beautiful new book that reflects with great credit your meticulous research and skillful editing. Well, my reading from the works of J. Frank Doby is a replication of a reading presented two years ago at Bill Sibley's and Mary Margaret's, Mary Margaret Campbell's Doby Dichos in, down in Live Oak County. And, and we'll hear from Bill in a moment, and I know Mary Margaret is here, and uh, I should uh, say that uh, I hope both of you will forgive us for borrowing this from, from your venue. I should mention that what I will read presents a certain irony in that it is not included in, in Steve's new book, so it may be the case that it's not essential. <laughs> but. Uh, but you should know that Steve personally requested it, so perhaps it's a close runner-up at least. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is read from this book titled Tongues of the Monty. It was J. Frank's fourth book, and it was published originally in 1935 and was reprinted twice more after that, once under a different title, The Mexico I Like and then reprinted again under the title Tongues of the Monte. And uh, keeping with the essential theme here, I'm endeavoring to adhere to time limitations, although it's not going to happen, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm excer excerpting pieces about only one of the book's characters, whose name is Innocencio and more specifically about Innocencio's knife that was named the Faithful Lover. First, some relevant background that J. Frank provided in his introduction to a, a later edition of the book. And he said, in 1928, the country gentleman to which magazine I was doing considerable writing about that time sent me at my request on a pack trip across the Sierra Madre of Chihuahua and Sonora to write the story of the lost Tayopa mine, as Steve alluded to a moment ago. And, and that story is, in, of course, in Steve's new book. At the time, I thought it the most interesting story of adventure any human being could imagine. The Guggenheim Foundation gave me a grant of money for living in Mexico a year to gather materials. During this year and during years that immediately followed, I made various trips on horseback or muleback. With pack outfit and mozo, a mozo being a combination guide and servant, wandering through the vast unpopulated mountains of Mexico, lingering at ranches and mining camps, living the truest, freest times of my life. The written result was this book, of course. <laughs> 
this book. So here we go about his guide and servant. I was to come to know Innocencio better than I know most men and to owe him my life. In certain ways, he justified his name, Innocencio. The younger vaqueros called him Don Innocencio. Innocencio pulled from its long scabbard a knife and began whetting it on a stone taken from his morale. That looks like a particularly good knife you have, I remarked. Of course, this is J. Frank. Yes, senor, one of the other vaqueros spoke out, and it has a name and it has a history. What is its name? I addressed the question to the man who had given me an opportunity to ask it. The faithful lover, he answered with a laugh, read what it says for itself. And there was stamped crudely but plainly on one side of the knife, yo te amo, which of course means I love you. Innocencio said, during times of revolution years ago now, destiny took me above the mouth of the Rio Soto River above the Pacific Ocean. For a while, we kept camp in a pueblo where the men fished and where there was a priest. The priest was a good man, but always went by the rules in books. Innocencio said, one day while some women were washing down at the edge of the water, a shamaco, a little boy, waded out to catch a horse of the devil, a dragonfly, with red wings. The dragonfly went farther out and the boy followed. He was just playing, his mother told. She heard a scream and saw a shark cutting him in two. She rushed to the rescue, but all she got was the legs and part of the trunk. Poor little boy, poor little mother, poor little father. The father, Innocencio continued, was in his house just a little way off. It happened that I was talking to him at the moment when the cries of the women came to us. He grabbed his knife, which was always at hand. When we got to the water and saw what was left of the boy, he ran for the priest. Well, the priest came at once. He looked at the pieces of the child, saying it is not possible for the church to perform rites over this. The head is gone, the heart is gone, the home of the soul is not here, and it is for the soul that the church acts. Then his father turned to the mother. Show me exactly where the shark was, he commanded. She pointed and threw a rock to indicate. He didn't say a word. He threw a bait into the water at the spot where the rock had fallen knowing that the shark, hungry for more, was hunting, waiting. As he cast the bait, he began walking toward it, his eyes searching, his knife in his hand. He was not disappointed. The shallow water compelled the shark to show part of his body as he grabbed the bait. The man with the knife was against him. I could not say how long the two fought. I was without power to help, said Innocencio. Every person there looking was stone still. It was nakedness with a knife against teeth and lashing tail. The water showed streaks of blood, but in the end, the shark was dead. The man hauled him to the bank and slashed his belly open. And there, the head and heart of his son showed themselves. The priest had not said a word during all this time, not one little word. But now he said, the church will bury the child. Thanks be to God, the father said. Then J. Frank asked, and so this is the knife, the faithful lover that killed the shark? Si, sí, senor, for a favor the boy's father gave it to me. And now I'm moving to the closing chapter of the book and the end of J. Frank's travels with Innocencio. J. Frank continued, I felt regret that the morrow's night would find us at Sierra Mojado, whence a train runs to Chihuahua City. There, Innocencio, the good old man who had served me so well, 
and I must part, he to go back, and I to go on. Innocencio said to me, and now my master and my friend, you have been frank with me and you understand. After God, you are next with me. With a little embarrassment tinging his pleasure, Innocencio laid the scabbard containing the faithful lover upon my bed. I was to keep it as a require though, a memento of one who wished always to serve me. I stood on the platform of the lurching car until a, a curve cut off view of the station. As long as I looked, I saw the old man who could be stately though and who had muscles that never tired. An enormous straw hat on the ground beside him making the gesture of the open heart towards me, touching his breast with his fingers, with, and then extending his arms and holding them stretched out wide apart. And thus ends the story of Innocencio as well as the book. But I have a footnote to all of this. We tend to discount the, the factualness of folklore and thus the question is this story true? A few of you know what's coming next. After my father died, we found in his collection a knife and a scabbard with a, a handwritten note. And I'm going to read you the handwritten note. This is my father's note. This knife has engraved on the right side Yo te amo, which means I love you. This knife with its scabbard was presented to me by J. Frank Doby shortly after he returned from Mexico, following his travels there on horseback in search of materials for his book, Tongues of the Monte. Frank relates how his mozo, Innocencio, gave him the knife, which he refers to as the faithful lover, and he mentions the scabbard. Close that quote. Well, perhaps folklore indeed can be factual, and I'd be happy to show any of you later the, the, the knife. Steve, ple pleasure to be with you. Thank you for that. Wow, what an amazing artifact. And um, so can you tell us a little bit about you know, my understanding is that the, the Dobie house, or Dobie's lived in Austin, um, was slated to be torn down and turned into a 7-Eleven at some point. Can you tell us what happened to prevent that from happening? <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to refer to a note here in a moment. Um, that's exactly right. In 1984, Bertha Dobie died, and uh, Chip mentioned that uh, Edgar Kincaid, her nephew, inherited the house and, and lived there. Well, he died just a few years later. I'm, I'm sorry, Bertha died in 74. Edgar lived there until 84 or 85 when he died. And um, he left the house to his longtime secretary, who had been Jay Frank's longtime secretary. Uh, Willie Bell Coker. She had decided that it would be sold to the Southland Corporation of Dallas and it was going to become a 7 Eleven store. So Seiza and I, uh, after some efforts to, you know, Winston Churchill was famous for saying, Americans always do the right thing after exhausting all other possibilities. <laughs> well, we, we exhausted all other possibilities and we decided we would buy it ourselves. And we did. We spent 14 months totally rehabilitating it. And um, it became our home for several years until 1995, and uh, at that time, uh, James Mishner, the famous writer, had 
then recently in, endowed the new center for writers that would bear his name by giving $40 million to the University of, of Texas. And he became interested in, in the, the, the Adobe House. And um, he, uh, he carried a lot of weight at the time, obviously, with the powers that be at uh, the university. And uh, he persuaded the university that it should become the headquarters for the, what became known as the James Mishner Center for Writers at, at the J. Frank Doby House. And uh, here's what I was looking for. He, uh, there was a, a dedication of the house as the Writers' Center on November 29, 1995. And Mr. Mishner, of course, was specially recognized and uh, gave remarks at the dedication. And here's an exact quote from his remarks. He said, no one in this room could possibly know that when I was a beginning writer, I received a letter from Texas that said, Mr. Mishner, I have read your work and it has real promise. If you're ever down this way, look me up. I think that we have a lot in common. It was signed by J. Frank Doby. <laughs> then Mr. Mishner closed by saying, tonight I have answered that letter. And he, and he did. <laughs> okay. and, and let me just ask you one other thing too. Um, so of all the people here, you sort of, you and your sister Marcel who are here probably got to spend more time with Frank Doby than anybody else. So can you tell us a little bit about what he was like in person, in, in your memory? Well, I could go on for a long time, but I, I'm going to make this very short. And I think I'll divide it, Steve, into, into three parts, three very short parts. Uh, first was his memorable trademark image. And you did a wonderful job of capturing that image on the the, uh, That's an Edward Weston photograph, by the cover way. Of this the cover of book. So, yeah. so he, here was his trademark image. Uh, a Stetson hat. He always wore a khaki shirt with shoulder epaulets, khaki pants, always had a, a bent wood pipe. Um, he always had a broad smile. He was the type of person I looked forward to being around because of his, his warm personality, and, and people were just drawn to him. The second part of this, and Chip mentioned the, the house on Waller Creek, he loved water. He loved everything about water, including how to mix it with whiskey. <laughs> But having grown up in the drouthy brush country of South Texas, he obviously made a conscious decision that in his adult life he was always going to live around water, which he did on Waller Creek uh, there in Austin where his home was. His first retreat was uh, the Cherry Springs Ranch in Burnett County, which incidentally straddled three different creeks. And then in his later years to be closer home, his retreat, the Paisano Ranch, which was on Barton Creek, as we mentioned earlier. But lastly, I want to comment on his diligence as a writer and a teacher. He, he had lots of causes. And he took people and things to task unmercifully, <clears throat> but it was always that diligence as a, as a writer that took center stage, and he loved to nurture other writers. So those are my best recollections. Okay, thank you very much, Dudley.
Thank you. Next up, we have William Jack Sibley, Bill to his friends. He's a dynamically talented novelist, playwright, and screenwriter. Uh, Bill writes hilarious and even madcap stories, uh, always infused with the generosity of spirit and a deep appreciation for the nuances of human behavior. Bill can do it all. He's written dialogue for TV soap operas. He's been a contributing editor at Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine. His plays have won several awards, have been, have been produced off-Broadway and around the country. Uh, Bill's won several festival awards and seen numerous film options as a screenwriter. Uh, he's also the author of two acclaimed award-winning novels set in Texas. And like Frank Doby, Bill Sibley comes from a brush country ranching family. And for the past nine years, you've heard a little bit about this. Bill and Mary Margaret Campbell, who's also here, have been the hosts, and Bill's been the MC of an outstanding literary festival called Doby Dichos, which, where Bill brings together the leading writers in the state every year and has them interpret the works of J. Frank Doby. And when Dudley was doing this two years ago, uh, Bill Whitlip was also uh, part of that event. And, um, you know, Bill has really done so much to spark this kind of current Doby revival that we're seeing right now. Bill is as dynamic in person as he is on this page. So please join me in welcoming Bill Sibley. <laughs> I really want to meet this Bill Sibley one day. That's a <laughs> great introduction. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, I want to thank the writers who come to Dobie Dichos that are here. Uh, Naomi, Chip, uh, John, uh, John, Felipe, <laughs> John Philip Santos. Um, who else is, who am I looking at? Were, who else has come Bob to Dobie Dichos? Steve, Bob Flynn. Thank you guys. Uh, you know, it's uh, Mary Margaret and I started this nine years ago. Mary Margaret, where are you? There she is. Uh, nine years ago to uh, pay honor to the Mark Twain of South Texas, the great storyteller of our great state, J. Uh, Frank Doby. And uh, it's, been, it's been amazing. Every writer I've asked has said yes. I'll be there. I think Mary Margaret has had the same uh, acceptance from performers and musicians that have come out there. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, we welcome you all to please come visit us. It's always the first Friday in November. Uh, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold. We had a great year this year. We had uh, uh, Chip Dameron and we had uh, Sergio Troncoso and we had um, Celeste uh, Walker from uh, Houston, and uh, who am I missing? Uh, Tish Hinojosa was there, and, Sa and Sarah Bird from Austin. Yes, thank you. So um, anyway, uh, as a child growing up in, in South Texas, I would read the only books that my grandparents had in their home by this gentleman called J. Frank Doby. And I really for the first time in my life, realized that this man was writing about places that I actually knew of. It wasn't castles in Europe or some fairy tale. These were places that I'd, I'd been to as a child. It was, it was monumental um, that somebody could write about dry, dusty South Texas and make it so compelling and interesting and, uh, wow, what a great place. Um, so anyway, Dobie has always been somebody that I've, I've looked up to, I've admired. Um, he's a bit of a crank, which I really admire. Um, you know, he spoke from his heart, from his soul, from the beginnings of his life growing up on that poor, hot, desert South Texas ranch, that country that I know very well. And uh, he's a great inspiration. And, Steve's book, by the way, he did the most amazing job of, as you say, cleaning the, uh, the rust off of some of Dobie's uh, flowery parts. And it is, I, I got into bed one night and I started reading it, and this is the greatest thing a writer can hear is, I hate you, I couldn't go to sleep last night because you stayed up all night reading the book, and I did. 
and it was fantastic. And you have brought Dobie back to us in a really powerful, beautiful way, and I thank you very much. So I'm going to be reading Only a Man with Eyes in Back of His Head, which was written in 1943. And I'm going to start this off in my best Texas gentleman voice. This is the voice of J. Frank Dobie. At our mother's home in Beeville for Christmas, my brother Elrich gave me some advice. I always liked to listen to Elrich. He told me to quit being critical of affairs of state and society and go back to cows, cow horses, bob wire, road runners, and a thousand other items in the tradition of Texas. He might be right. I don't want to be personal, but a man's bound to think these days. I'm going to try to keep the dust out of my eyes so that I can see the main target. I want to see whether the target is the good of mankind, the freedoms, or just greed. J. Frank Toby. <laughs> Something over 100 years ago, Davy Crockett of Tennessee killed 105 bears in one season and the next summer got elected to Congress on his reputation. <laughs> Littler men have been elected for smaller reasons since. Crockett looked wise, but later confessed that he did not know any more about the ju judiciary than a hog knows about a side saddle. <laughs> because of his picturesqueness, he cut something of a swath in politics. The national government was at that time, compared with the present, as simple as the setting up of a backwoods homestead. All a man had to do was to find a wife, squat on free land, build a cabin out of tree logs, kill his meat out of the woods, raise a little corn and a few pumpkins. It cost Crockett about $10 to furnish his cabin. There was land fertile and free for everybody who wanted it. The government had not yet begun its policy of subsidizing railroad companies with the 158 million acres of land, an area about the size of Texas, a wonderful catalyst for free enterprise among railroad magnates headquartered in Washington. The government had hardly begun its policy of protective tariffs that was, the, that was the make the great manufacturing enterprises free to reach into the pockets of the poorest farmers. The great American forests stood in their pristine nobility and waved their beautiful tops over tens of millions of acres of land as yet untouched by the free enterprisers who were to turn them into deserts, regardless of the effect on erosion, on floods, on soil owned by farmers, and without regard to national needs for timber in the next generation. You get where we're going here? <laughs> without regard to anything but booming profits for the free enterprisers themselves. So, far as an ordinary citizen was concerned, there might almost have been no government. No foreign power threatened us. Although there was slavery, in a way the white citizens of America were nearly as free of control as were the great herds of Mustang horses descended from escaped Spanish stock, grazing on the free grass of coastal prairies and high plains. The free grass and free soil was conducive to free enterprise. Then, about 10 years before the century ended, there was no longer either free grass or free soil to speak of. The free Mustangs that had tossed their heads so wild and beautiful on the free grass had been killed and roped off by men who wanted to use the grass. The mighty herds of buffaloes that once moved on the great sea of grass as primordially as the winds were all but annihilated. Only a man with eyes in the back of his head could expect now to return to free grass and free soil normalcy. While the century was approaching its end, a great drought caused widespread distress among settlers on western lands that had but recently been grazed by mustangs and buffaloes. Congress voted an appropriation to relieve the distressed President Grover Cleveland vetoed the appropriation with the observation that it was the business of the people to support the government and not the business of the government to support the people. The great corporations that had so long been beneficiaries of government enforced tariffs to protect the goods they manufactured piously agreed with the President. Meanwhile, the country was striding in seven-league boots to become what it is today, technically and mechanically the most highly developed and most abundantly supplied in the world. 
The man with the hoe, regarded from times immemorial as the brother to the ox, must follow the science of soils and cultivation if he is to reap profit from what he sows. The banker who used to do nothing but sit in his counting house accounting out his money must now know how to obey and how to get around several volumes with tax laws. Must be prepared to administer a state so complicated that they would stump a Philadelphia lawyer and he is enough of an economist to look with contempt on political charlatans who try to laugh the science of economics out of existence. We laugh at the alphabetical combinations that indicate government bureaucracies. I hold no brief for bureaucracy, but it seems to me that in the Army, there are as many alphabetical combinations representing technical operations as there are in the government. Think of how much more a crew of one of those flying fortresses must know and how much more they must coordinate than the driver of a Ford truck. Think, then think how much there is to a truck than there was to an old time cart in Davy Crockett's day. We became a machine geared technical scientific world quite a while ago. We accepted it for every part of life except for politics and government. We still favor a Davy Crockett who killed 105 bears in one season, and though he does not know the judiciary from Adam's off ox, we will elect him to make laws that not even a wise judiciary could serve the country from. We elect to the United States Senate a conscious ignoramus who cannot give a single concrete fact about democracy, who has not the least conception of constitution, who has never seen an imagination guessed at the far-reaching and intricate effects of tariffs, whose sole interest in two world wars has been to avoid service in the first and then to complain about rationing during the second. <laughs> it is infantile to go back to normalcy Harding's motto. Less government in business and more business in government. The government is going to stay in business because it is the people's business. I had rather fish than think, but if I go fishing anywhere inland in America, I'll be fishing for fish planted and controlled by government agencies. Wishing for the simple old days will not bring them back. We had a simple government when we had a simple life. A complex government is required to coordinate and balance the maze and complexities in our increasingly complicated and technical world. Maybe someday the whole structure of scientifically mechanized civilization will topple over and we will wear fig leaves again in apple orchards instead of electrically heated suits to keep us warm in the stratosphere where the air we breathe comes out of tanks. Until then, the wisdom in government will depend on science, on knowledge. It is sweet to sing the old time religion but religion by itself cannot manage this tangled world. And that is J. Frank Dobie. Yeah, and that, and that quote, that <clears throat> conscious ignoramus we elected, who, who was he referring to? <laughs> Only he knows. No, we, and we do know it was actually Pappy Leo Daniel, uh, so who was elected to the Senate, and, and yeah, Dobie had lots of issues with him. Um, so, Bill, and thanks for telling us about Dobie Dichos, your personal connection to Dobie. Take just a moment to tell us about so these two novels you've written in Texas that turned out to be part of a trilogy, right? Uh -huh. And you're finishing. Yeah. The, tell us about the the novel that you're finishing currently. Uh, I was telling Naomi earlier. These are, these are kind of adult books, I, you know, they're not about granddad's Arrowhead collection. Um, I went to Marfa to do a book signing, and I got there, and the lady running the book service was very excited, and she said, oh, there's so much going on tonight, I didn't think anybody would show up, so we've asked the Methodist Ladies Club to come. <laughs> I read the nicest, cleanest part of my book. They bought all the books. I got out of town real quick. Thanks, Bill. All right. Well, we're going to show you this uh, short video. Uh, and you're going to see a couple of different snippets of Bill Whitliff talking about J. Frank Doby um, and that, that uh, Doby footage I mentioned. And uh, in the second part of this little short film, you're going to see Bill Whitliff from just two years ago, or about a year and a half ago, 
And for that footage, I just want to mention that we have our Vice President for Information Technology and Cinematographer Extraordinaire Ken Pierce to thank for capturing that video. Thank you. Ken. One day, Sally was walking down the drag and Dobie was in the co-op signing books. So it was about my birthday. So when Sally got home, she called Dobie and she said, would you sign a book for my boyfriend? And so Dobie said, sure, bring it over. And so Sally did. And he wrote a really nice inscription. And on my 21st birthday, that's what Sally gave me as a gift. And, um, and of course, I thought, that was really cool. I was going to marry this girl. Um, <laughs> But it took me about four months to work up the courage to call Dobie and ask if I could come over and, and visit and get a book signed. And he said, sure, come on. Dudley, of course, you know this story. But uh, he said, sure, come, come over. He said, come after four. He said, I take a little siesta, but if you come after four, I'll be glad to chat with you and so on. So precisely at four, I was at Dobie's front door on Park Place knocking, and there was no answer. And I knocked and I knocked and I thought, oh well. But I walked around the backyard, which was on Waller Creek, and Dobie was back there uh, in a pair of cut-off khaki pants, a uh, little, little glass of uh, Jack Daniels whiskey, and a garden hose. And he was taking a shower bath. <laughs> so I walked over and introduced myself, and, and we chatted for just a second. And uh, he said, well, come on in the house. And at Dobie's house, you walk from the backyard to some steps, and then you went up the steps, and there was a little landing, and then you went into the house on the side. So Dobie led the way. As he got to the landing, I was just hitting the bottom step. And it was at that moment that he turned, and he said, are you out at the university? And I said, yes, sir, I'm in the School of Journalism. And when I said journalism, I mean, his eyes flashed, and he spun on me, and he said, journalism? He said, God damn you, boy. He said, why don't you take something that'll put fiber in your mind? <laughs> and uh, so that was kind of the start of the relationship. <laughs> uh, and I went many, many, many times to visit Dobie, always with a book. Um, and I would always come home with maybe 10 other things that he gave me while I was there. You know, it's uh, writing about uh, cowboys. Uh, well, the Zane Gray School, the Hollywood School, uh, won't let one come quietly out. Uh, he he, he, he can't, doesn't come out the door. He jumps out the window. If he's not shooting one six shooter, he's shooting two. But, uh, <laughs> I can't, uh, I know, I get ashamed of myself sometimes for having written so many stories about lost mines and buried treasure because people think I've written directions for finding uh, wealth. Well, uh, I never wrote any, of course, you know. I wrote, I was in love with a story. I've been a hunter of stories, not a hunter of lost mines and buried treasures. And uh, a lot of these stories are made by a very credulous uh, people uh, but uh, they don't lie about life as I said every time I would go visit Dobie he would just load me up with things he thought I ought to read and he never said it but it was because he thought I'm sure that I was pretty close to the ground ignorant on a lot of things, and so he would give me, he would give me these things. Hey, y'all yeah, read this and so on. Anyway, um, Sally and I got married. Then off I went to basic training um, in the Air National Guard, and I was in my second or third week of basic training, which is not not a good place. And uh, all of a sudden, I got a letter from Dobie who was at the Huntington Library at the time he wrote it. And how he, got, how he got it to me, I don't know, because a military address, a military address, you know, is this, and it's this, and it's this, and it's, it is forever long. But all of a sudden, here was a letter from Dobie um, with found the, my basic training address. So I opened it, and it was an article 
on the proper use of language um, from the Saturday Review of Literature. And he said, yeah, you read this and you pay attention to it and, you know, and try to learn from it and so on. And then at the end he said, I am interested in you. And I tell you, what a gift. What a gift. And so, you know, blessings on you, Mr. Doby. lovely as Bill's story of, of Doby is, you know, the archive is just full of those stories. One of the things we have on exhibit is um, a kid who is about, uh, I think he's 11 or 12, maybe, I can't remember now, but he sent Doby a, a fan letter and Doby just wrote him back right away and just was so encouraging. And there are so many writers that he mentored and, um, you know, from, from what James Michener did to what Bill and Sally Whitliff did, it's just, it's a lovely thing to be a part of. Um, so, our next reader here is John Philip Santos. He's a National Book Award finalist whose beautifully written books explore how the uniquely blended cultures of this part of the world came into being and how this mestizaje represents our future. Born and raised in San Antonio, John Philip won a scholarship to Notre Dame and then became the first Mexican-American Rhodes Scholar. He moved to New York, writing and producing Emmy-nominated television documentaries for CBS and PBS. And then John Philip came back to Texas. He now teaches at UT San Antonio, where he is the University Distinguished Scholar in Mestizo Cultural Studies to the Honors College. John Philip is a visionary public intellectual. In addition to his acclaimed books, he's written many enlightening essays, including a recent article in Texas Monthly that dissects the relationship between Americo Paredes and J. Frank Dovey. John Philip is one of the brightest lights in Texas someone we are so pleased to have join us today. So please join me in welcoming John Philip Santos. Thanks, y'all. Uh, I'm, I'm cavelling right now. You know the term cavelling, an old Chicano term? Uh, I'm cavelling on celebrating my master, J. Frank Doby. Um, who I held so close as a young writer. Um, he represented to me um, the Tejano Baroque. I thought for a while he might be a Chicano writer. You know, I mean, I first started reading him before there really was Chicano literature. So I came to J. Frank Doby's work partly for the way that he revealed the connections of what we knew as Texas to our most ancient origins, um, the indigenous world and the world of the landscape. Um, and I'm also humbled to be here uh, celebrating Bill Whitliff. Um, it's the first time I've been here since uh, I saw Bill last at um, a celebration for Sandra Cisneros' work. And um, the photographs that surround us just also give testimony to this story that uh, in a sense, he did inherit in some part from, from Adobe, but brought his own incredible visionary visual gift to this telling of this story. Um, the fact that it begins with the Vaquero world and that gallery over here and the, um, uh, the work that uh, Bill did in the 70s to this last work, this, this cosmic work, the connection between the landscape, the Vaquero world, and the cosmic world. Um, it's something that I think Dobie had some role in imparting. Um, you know, I don't think you really can claim to be a Texas writer unless you've stolen from Dobie. <laughs> so I didn't know Cormac McCarthy was as, well, uh, unabashed about it as, uh, as Steve points out in the, his introduction. But I know that I learned how to write about Mexico in part through Doby. Um, so when I was writing in, in the book that, that uh, Steve mentioned, uh, Places Left Unfinished at the Time of Creation, uh, I know I copped a lot of ranch writing from the Doby uh, uh, lexicon and from his gestures and 
his way of connecting the everyday to the cosmic, to the universal. Um, I'm also going back to Tongues of the Monte, um, as Dudley did. And it's also somewhat humbling to stand in front of uh, Dudley. I don't know if anybody else is getting it, but he's a dead ringer for his, his cousin, his, his, his uh, cousin ancestor. Uh, the, the Doby gene runs very strong. Um, you know, I wanted, before I read the section from uh, Steve's brilliant anthology, but I'm, I'm wondering actually how Doby would feel about the fact that this visionary uh, writer, Steve Davis, would uh, follow his biography, Do his biography of Doby, with a, di a biography of Timothy Leary. Uh, <laughs> Doby and Leary, two of my idols. Uh, I wonder what Steve is plotting next. Um, but I, uh, Steve didn't include this um, section in just a, a paragraph, really. Another aspect of Dobie's visionary uh, Texanness, his Tejanidad, um, is from the preface to Tongues of the Monte. And actually, this, um, this uh, edition of Tongues of the Monte was a gift I gave to my father in 1977. The dedication was Un Pedacito de la Tierra Bendita, uh, Feliz Navidad, uh, a piece of the blessed land, uh, Merry Christmas, 77. So uh, here's Dobie being prophetic about a certain aspect of Texanness. I cannot remember my first association with Mexicans, for I was born and reared in a part of Texas, the brush country towards the border below San Antonio, where Mexicans were, and still are, more numerous than people of English-speaking ancestry. At that time, few of them spoke English, though many of them were native-born. He was visionary about being majority-minority. It was an incredible story um, in his origin. So this is a little section from Tongues of the Monte. Um, uh, something, maybe a little uh, point of envy between uh, myself and Dobie was, you know, he got a Guggenheim to go ride horseback in Mexico for a year. Uh, I mean, where do we get in line for that? Um, so this is an extraordinary book, as, as Dudley already mentioned, and it's, it's, it's consistently evoking something that I spoke about in this essay in Texas Monthly about this relationship between Américo Paredes, uh, Mexican-American visionary, and their long relationship, complicated relationship to Dobie. Um, Paredes had this idea of greater Mexico, that greater Mexico constituted those lands that had been uh, usurped after the Mexican-American War. Um, Dobie had a comparable term, which he never coined, I've coined for him, of greater Texas, um, a kind of borderless land uh, that stretched from the Sierra Madre at least to the hill country. Um, and in Bolson, in the um, Tongues of the Monte, he, he rides in the Bolson de Mapimia, a part of Mexico that I actually knew very well. Like part of what I stole from him was familiarity with this landscape in part of Coahuila. Uh, and here in, in the epigraph that, that Steve reproduces from uh, the, uh, the book, he, he evokes this very neatly. He says, the great Comanche war trail was worn deep by the hoofs of countless travelers over generations of time and was lined with the whited bones of horses. In Texas, it has been plowed up, tramped over, cemented under. Trains and automobiles annually carry across it thousands of English-speaking people who are not aware that it ever existed. But across the Bolson de Mapimi and the land fringing upon it, the raiders who beat out the Comanche Trail ride vividly in memory. For days we, that stretched into weeks, we rode. After twisting up cañones lined with cedar, traversing arid and unstocked mesas merely patched with grass, and threading passes over mountains fringed with pine and piñon, we left all fence lines and came by degrees out onto that vast and vaguely defined desert known as the Bolson de Mapimi, on some old maps called 
Tierra de Muerte, Land of Death. This is the southernmost portion of the Chihuahuan Desert, ranging below the Big Bend of Texas from the Rio Bravo southward through western Coahuila and into neighboring Chihuahua and Durango, skirting Zacatecas and San Luis Potosí. Maddenly monotonous, except to one who can read infinity in a grain of sand. A quote from William Blake. The Bolson de Mapimi is an immense, seemingly barren land, yet productive of a fantastic life. It stretches out an irregular, elevated basin hemmed around by low, naked mountains that infringe up and crumple it and are always in sight. These shed the sparse rainfall into arroyos that are bone dry a few hours after a rain and sink into the parched solitude. It is as if a vast ocean had been petrified to remain forever silent. A traveler through this region is fortunate to reach water of any kind once a day, and he must tack his course to do that. The patches of coarse wire-like sabaneta grass or the equally tough toboso or the fibrous chino are always far from any watering. Generally, we camped with no water except that carried in canteens. Occasionally, we stopped at a lone rancheria of poverty. The nights grew freezing cold. The days remained blazing hot. The sun flooded the immense vacuity of the sky, the intense light blinding against the ashen soil. The powdered alkaline dust raised by the feet of our horses was swept into the nostrils of both man and beast. And so we rode. It was as if I had never known any other land, any other life. The foothills were covered with black rock, which appeared to have been spewed out of a furnace. Now and then, we came to sand dunes on which grew gray switch mesquite and gray chamiso, their roots affording fuel. Far away, sometimes a valley appears green. That green is an expanse of the Ocotillo, each stalk studded with thorns protecting its miniature stemless leaves. All one afternoon, I rode through a plain of big palmas, yucas, a flutter with thousands and tens of thousands of silent migratory bluebirds. Moving seamlessly as slow as the desert terrapin day after day through the gray and immense solitude of the Bolson de Mapimi, a man grows to feel that no human drama ever was enacted, ever could be enacted on such an unrelieved and empty stage. Yet here also human history has written itself. Somehow the long, lone cry of a bolson coyote in the night suggests human destinies as eloquently as the broken arches of the Colosseum ever spoke to Byron. By day, the omnilucent glare of the sun palpitates an Iliad of vanished races, vanished centuries, and vanished ways of human life. Under that sun, long, long ago, the conquistadores rode north this way to gather Indian slaves for their mines. They rode back, and behind them came the Comanches beating out their great war trail. West of the Pecos in Texas, on the two great paralleling cordilleras of Mexico and over the broken plateau that lies between them, it usually rains in the summer, the average rainfall varying greatly according to the lay of the land. By September, the grass is ripe and the holes are full of water. And so to old people in northern Mexico, the September moon is still the moon of the Comanches though the Comanches themselves called it the Mexicano moon. For it was under this moon that they annually swooped down. Astride half-wild horses captured from the Mustang herds of the plains or from the caballadas of Mexican rancherias raided the season before. They rode on stirrupless pads of sheepskin or buffalo hide, their bits and bridle reins alike of rawhide. Their arms were mostly 
bow and arrows, the bows of osage orange, the arrows of vara dulce, palo duro, or other tough growth. The arrows were carried in a quiver of wildcat hide slung from the shoulder. Each warrior was provided with a lance of ashwood and chimal, or a shield, of dried buffalo hide. Some of them carried bowie knives, or machetes from Mexico. And here there was one armed with an old blunderbuss escopeta. In the time of the Comanche moon, they rode down the Comanche war trail, which was from their range of the Llano Estacado to the depths of the Bolson de Mapimi, half a thousand miles southward, stretched as plain as a chalk mark. Once across the Rio Bravo, these Cossacks of the desert scattered, some to push up the Rio Conchos to the very walls of Chihuahua City, some to harass the ranches of faraway Durango, some to veer east and raid haciendas in Coahuila, where, in the region of Saltillo at least, cattle went unbranded for years because there were no horses on which to work them. The Comanches raided even into the states of Zacatecas, San Luis Potosí, and Aguascalientes. Boys, girls, young women, and horses were their object. The children to be raised as true Comanches, the young women to serve as squaws and horses, never enough horses to ride, the symbol of power and glory and riches of all the Plains Indians. Before the bitter nortes of winter blew down, the Comanche trail was again vivid with life northward bound. On some of the captured horses were the lashed captives. About the belts of the captors that drove them dangled scalps taken from the kinsmen of the captives. The dust from the hoofs of horses rose in clouds. Behind them rolled clouds of smoke from grass fires set to impede pursuers. Now and then bands deflected from the trail to shun avengers. Against this ravaging, the central government did nothing. Far removed from the center where politicians lied and generals fought to possess the spoils of office, haciendas and ranches comprising an empire were by a few hundred naked Comanches kept shuddering with terror. The only remedio was a bounty on scalps. The governor of Chihuahua stipulated that 100 pesos would be paid for the scalps of warriors and 50 pesos for squaws. Then into the Bolson and the Sierras rode James Kirker and John Joel Glanton and other scalp hunters, some of them from Texas. A scalp was a scalp to them. And when their perfidy in murdering innocent natives for the bounty was discovered, they had to flee. In New Mexico, the bounty was on ears instead of scalps. And in the governor's palace at Santa Fe, where windows of glass and festoons of Indian ears were laid. When the Englishman George Ruxton reached Chihuahua City in 1846, he saw dangling over the portals of the cathedral the grim scalps of 170 Apaches who had lately been treacherously and inhumanely butchered by the Indian hunters in the pay of the state. 28 years later, August Santleben, noted freighter of the Chihuahua Trail, saw on the plaza in front of the cathedral a procession of conquerors accompanied by bands of music displaying scalps on poles. For half a century, the price of scalps rose and fell, and not all the raiders who rode down the war trail lived to ride back. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, a little grim, huh? That was that was uh, it was Cormac McCarthy and Sam Peckinpah. I think may have drawn yeah. from that. Yeah, and you, and you know, and that. It was so hard to pick things from Tongues of the Monte because that is that book is full of great stuff. But you know that story and this anthology goes on, and you see Dobie riding through through uh, the desert and and ending up at this little rancheria, where yeah they're sort of given the last corn these people have. It's yep. it's really stunning. Yep. So um, talk to us a little bit because you mentioned to me that you were um, you know a lot of people in this audience may not be aware, but Dobie is as 
seen as controversial at best among many Chicano scholars and so forth. Yep. We were talking about, you were at a, a talk in San Antonio a couple months ago, and yep. you heard a very prominent Chicano scholar basically called Doby a racist or whatever. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you think, we sort of know how that happened in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but can you talk about you know, your article yeah. in Texas Monthly, and so you see how this kind of yeah. going. I mean, I grew up, as I said earlier, you know, I grew up uh, with a sense of uh, a kindredness about Dobie, uh, partly because I had the story from my mother that uh, she remembered him hanging out with my grandfather on the porch of their grocery store in Catula, you know, and that uh, he would be there quite often hanging out, listening to stories and writing down, she said, it with a tiny little pencil in a notebook. She remembered a cigar, maybe it was a pipe. Uh, she was not a smoker, she wouldn't be discriminating about these things, but, uh, you know, so I had this sense, and as I, you know, as a, as a young uh, reader, got into Tongues of the Monte, Apache Gold, and Yaki Silver, which were, are my two favorites, um, you know, the sense of, of Dobie's uh, simpatico for the, the Mexican world. Um, so, you know, there was this other story about Paredes taking on Dobie in his legendary work uh, with his pistol in his hand, the Gregorio Cortez story. Um, he takes on not only Dobie, and this was uh, Paredes as a young uh, doctoral student, takes on Dobie and even more uh, notoriously Walter Prescott Webb. And the uh, Texas Rangers. And the Texas Rangers. So it was a kind of a trifecta yeah. of uh, <laughs> sacred cows that, that Paredes sets out to gore with his first book. Um, you know, what I uncovered in, in doing that story was uh, the, the deeply moving way that, that Dobie and Paredes then over many decades struck up uh, a kinship. Um, and they were both uh, uh, undervalued by UT. Um, uh, Paredes in his own way, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, summarily fired in the way that Dobie was. Uh, but you know, I ultimately was able to, to connect with Alan Paredes, uh, Americo's son, who remembers very fondly uh, his dad hanging out with Jay Frank at uh, the Paisano Ranch. Um, and, um, and then actually Steve pointed out uh, an extraordinary moment, kind of, a, you know, only, only a bibli bibliographic nerds uh, get kind of uh, moved and, and get shivers of these kinds of things. But uh, um, there was a particular section of with his pistol in his hand where um, uh, Paredes was describing the horrific violence and the uh, misappropriation and, and usurpation of lands on the, by the hands of the Texas Rangers against the Mexicanos of the valley. And Steve pointed out that there's a little note from in Dobie's copy of with his pistol in his hands where Dobie says, just about right. Yeah, pretty uh, much the truth. Pretty I much think. the truth. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there was an incredibly moving story about that. I think they found some reconciliation on their own terms. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think, uh, I'm hoping that the anthology brings people back to these works that really illustrate the, just not yeah. the, the sense of Dobie as this kind of international mind, but the way that he was rooted in the South Texas reality, as Bill uh, mentioned, you know, his, his kinship that he speaks about early on in Tongues of the Monte with the vaqueros of his family's uh, ranch, um, which must have been his kind of first point of contact with the Mexican world. Hmm. Yeah, and you know, yeah. and as you're talking, I, I think I can see why Dobie identified with young, ignorant people like Bill Whitliff, or I, I know that feeling very well, because Dobie I himself wish, was that way. Yeah, and I think yeah. a lot of people have gone back to his very earliest writings and, and used that to sort of to find him and yeah. seen how he's evolved over the course of yeah. his life. So, A big kudos to you. Yeah. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. All right, you've made it through our Adobe Marathon. Thank you all for sticking with us through this. Um, those of us who are kind of bibliophilic geeks are having a great time here. Um, so I'm going to mention in introducing our, our final speaker that it was about a year ago when my wife Georgia and I drove our daughter Natalie to Houston, um, and we joined 70,000 other people at an intimate concert venue known as Reliance Stadium. <laughs> and we found our seats there and saw a stage far, far away. And we had made this journey to see the band uh, U2. And I had trouble actually seeing Bono from that distance. 
Uh, but they had these giant screens, of course, behind the stage where you could see everything. And it was on these screens that this wonderful surprise happened. And for me, it was the highlight of the concert, honestly, because you too begin scrolling a poem. And it's a poem that begins with these words. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Anybody know what that's from? It's Naomi Shihab Nye's Kindness. And so, you know, one of the most influential rock and roll bands in history thinks that Naomi Shihab Nye is cool enough to feature her poetry at their concert. And this should give you some idea of Naomi's reach, her influence, her way of knitting diverse communities of people together through her wondrous poems. Naomi recently had a new poem published in The New Yorker, average subscriber age 65. At the same time that she was being named the Young People's Poet Laureate, she's the author of more than 30 books, the winner of possibly thousands of awards. I actually tried to count them all, but I gave up last night, about midnight, Naomi. <laughs> um, so those who know Naomi uh, understand that she is a literary treasure. Her words have touched and helped heal so many people around the world. She is our patron saint for poetry here in Texas. And like the rest of us, she has a keen appreciation for J. Frank Doby. Please welcome Naomi. She have not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. You have done a wonder work with this incredible anthology. I love it so much. Uh, thanks to everyone who's here this magical day. I've never had a chance to meet any members of the Doby family before, so it's a great honor just to be in the same room with all of you. Uh, to David Coleman here, I want to thank you for your support of all of us and all we do. To President Trouth, it's been such an honor to be on the faculty here for the last three years. Such a pleasure. I love Texas State. And Sally Whitliff, there's no day that goes by that I don't think about Bill and you and what he meant to all of us who had a chance to meet him in the early 70s at Encino Press. The first conversation he and I ever had was about J. Frank Doby in Encino Press in Austin. Um, he will always be a hero to Michael and me, and we thank you for your continuation of his wonderful dreams. And Bill Sibley, for the greatest festival, Doby Dichos, we all love it so much. Thank you for all you have done to bring that one voice we've loved into larger, larger appreciation. Um, many, many years ago, Maury Maverick Jr., a hero in San Antonio and of the state of Texas, sent me a letter in the mail. I was young then. I had never met him. And he said, I would like to commission you at this moment to read uh, the Mustangs poem by J. Frank Doby at my funeral. <laughs> and I thought, so I wrote him back and I said, I would be honored to. I also like this poem very much, and I love J. Frank Doby, but wouldn't it be nice if you and I were friends first? So <laughs> we became very close friends for possibly 25 more years, and then I did read that poem uh, at Maury's funeral, and I cannot even remember when I fell under the spell of Doby. Uh, when I first met John Philip 45 years ago, I already knew Doby's work and loved it. Um, when I was combing through rare book stacks. Uh, as a young person, arrived in Texas at the age of 16. I still have some of those early Dobie books I found. But to have this book in our hands now is the great gift because we can buy it for other people. So thank you, Steve Davis, and your generosity is so enormous. I also want to thank the Dobie family for rescuing the house. For more than 20 years, I was privileged to teach for the James Missioner Center for writers in what I always told the students was Dobie's bedroom. I'm not positive it was his bedroom. It could have been an upstairs sitting room, but they were quite spellbound by this, and I always had them read, uh, read Dobie as well as Michener during our semester. Uh, they were fascinated. Most of them were not from Texas. So they were fascinated to read the stories of Doby and learn about him since we were there in his own house and room. It was a tender time in that room, many tears, much passion. It was a very intense class that James Michener himself had devised, the first year seminar. And uh, it meant a lot to, to be there in that particular building. And I came to feel closer and closer to Doby 
over the years, even once ending up spending the night in the house by myself, uh, at which point I felt that he entered the house around 3 a.m. and did things, and then later would learn it was the UT uh, trash collection department that <laughs> came to the house every night at 3 a.m. It seemed weird to me, but anyway. So because our table felt like a campfire, I wanted to read a few lines from the campfire chapter, which I love. And also I wanted to say that that night when I spent the night, I took the liberty of taking a scrapbook, which I had noticed for years on the shelf, but had never touched, that was made by um, J. Frank's mother. And in it, she had pasted all these beautiful articles about him in his early years of appearances. And there was one when he appeared uh, and she would write little notes in the scrapbook. Maybe that scrapbook is living here now. I'm not sure where it is, but it was incredible. Um, and she said at the Ladies Tea Club of Dallas, after speaking to 200 women, uh, he shook the hand of every woman at the end of the tea party. And that really touched me because he seemed to me in my love of his work like someone who would shake every hand. I like the campfire when it is blazing, and I like the last dim glow of its embers. I like talk by it, and I like silence beside it. It makes company more companionable, and it makes solitude richer. I remember certain campfires as I remember certain faces, certain friends, certain experiences that make human sympathies glow. I made various pack trips, mostly alone, across the Sierra Madre, and winding around through the mountains of western Mexico. I can look back on myself at certain campfires on those trips as another man. After riding all day in the cold, without seeing a human being or a fence, he makes camp behind a windbreak of trees. A creek of clear water flanks it on one side, and a glade of matted mesquite grass on the other. And then it goes on talking about, he fills his pipe and smokes it, looking into the fire. He is comfortable inside and out. The sound of the wind, only moderately high in the branches, adds to his feeling of being an unstriving master of time and of being in place without ambition to turn the place into capital gain. The man's mind tracks back to many things, to love, to his childhood hearth, to action, to illuminations out of literature, to good companions. Thoughts come to him on subjects far remote from the life he is leading, yet nothing seems remote to the light and the warmth of the fire. He spreads his hands before it, not because they are cold, but out of geniality. He remembers with understanding the ancient Persians who worshiped fire. He feels thankful to the unknown for wood and the mystery of its burning. The mystery of its burning. I thank J. Frank Doby for helping us all being more in place in Texas. And I thank you, Steve, for this masterpiece of a book you've given us. Thank you. Um, now, I know, thank you. Um, I've always felt that uh, when people finish books, everyone should give them gifts. And especially when you finish an anthology, because an anthology is really a labor of profound love and devotion. So this morning I was looking around my house and I thought, what do I have in this house that J. Frank Doby might have liked? So I found this basket that I bought in Chiapas, Mexico on the street at least 35 years ago. And I would like to give it to you in thanks for the basket of words you have given us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, well, you, and you, you talked about your connection to Doby and uh, being at the Missioner House. <clears throat> and um, and I, I just wanted to ask you, I saw you, you have a new book of poems in the works called, is it called Castaway? 
Yes, it's called Castaway. I already apologized to Bill Boyles, Bill Boyles here, and he said it. that was okay. That he didn't make that up either. But um, it's about trash. It's about trash collection, mm -hmm. and uh, my lifelong um, interest in cleaning up the place. So, <laughs> and it also has some poems, a series of poems called Trash Talk, and there are some things about our time in history and um, different relationships to trash. <laughs> so yes. next February, I, is that right? It's coming out in February, okay, yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thanks, thank you Naomi. so much. Okay, thank you all. So, and I, um, you know, one of, the things, one of the things Bill Whitliff liked to say is that we were trying to do with this collection the very same thing that Dobie was doing with his writing, and that is to connect us to this spirit of place for this part of the world to help us better understand and even be inspired by our rich cultural inheritance. And here's how J. Frank Doby put it. It seems to me that other people living in the Southwest will lead fuller and richer lives if they become aware of what it holds. Thank you all for joining us today. And I think we all lead richer and fuller lives by reading the best of J. Frank Doby. So be sure to grab a book if you haven't already, okay? <laughs> Thanks very much.